Hello and welcome to Biting Talk, Britain's liveliest food and drink podcast with me, William Sipar. I'm a restaurant critic for The Telegraph, a food writer and author, and I just love chatting to talented people in the world of food and drink. And this show, week in, week out, celebrates the wonders of that world, as well as tackling the many issues raised from economics to health and far beyond. And I think that this edition is set to be a glorious example of what we try to do. From Sweden, we meet one of the most talented cooks of the modern era. That's Nicholas Ekstedt. His acclaimed Stockholm restaurant is, he is written, like the Contiki, an historical experiment, a voyage of discovery, and all fueled by long-forgotten Swedish cooking techniques of fire and iron. Then we'll hop gastronomically to the Middle East to a taste of Persia with the supper club superstar Sabrina Gea. Sabrina is imploring us to try to cook Middle Eastern food every day, and I'll be asking her what ingredients we need in our store cupboards and fridges so we can give it a go. Then we meet heroic fishmonger from Cornwall, Paul Trudgeon. Now, Paul invented the lobster Zumador during lockdown, and he's now busy dispatching sustainable seafood across the country. But what makes his fishmonger different, I shall ask? And I'll be challenging him on the point that surely, if he really wants to support sustainability in seafood, then isn't the best thing for him not to sell any fish at all? And finally, we'll end the show with the biting talk mixologist Farhad Heydari, who this week is rustling up a cocktail using Remy Cognac. Now, did you know that a cognac only becomes a cognac when eau de vie has been in a barrel for two years? Mm-hmm. Farhad will give us some Remy intel as he mixes a French 75, which I think has got something to do with a 75 millimeter field gun from the First World War. <laughs> Let's hope it's as delicious as it is interesting. That's all we have coming up on this week's Biting Talk. But now to our first guest, uh, we welcome Nicholas Ekstedt. Nicholas, welcome to Biting Talk. Here he is. Nicholas, welcome to Biting Talk. Absolutely fantastic to see you. I'm really excited to talk to you. First of all, um, congratulations on your book. It is, it's beautiful. Um, If you're someone who loves food, um, who loves to really get stuck into, you know, the traditional cooking techniques of, of how fire can change proteins and make them delicious and tasty, it is wonderful. Tell us a bit about your journey to creating this amazing restaurant in Sweden that for us in this country, I think Adrian Gill highlighted. Um, you, you went on a mission to discover long lost cooking techniques of Stockholm. Yeah. You went to the Stockholm I, library. Tell us about that journey. Yeah. Actually, it, it started off with a complete meltdown. I had been a chef for quite a long time. And as you mentioned uh, earlier in the podcast, I worked at fine dining restaurants around the world. And then I moved home to Sweden and wanted to start the high-end fine dining restaurant. And that's what I did. And it was very highly acclaimed, but I thought it was very boring. And I very early in my cooking career ended up on TV as well. This was when Sweden was searching for their equivalent to Jamie Oliver. So, yeah. and, and this took you up on the direction that you decided you really didn't want to go in. Yeah. And so I ended up on TV and I was, you know, I was very young. I got a lot of like um, attention at a very young age and I didn't feel very comfortable with it. And when I was around 30 and our first son was on his way, I decided to take a break and completely leave the culinary world. And I was actually thinking of doing something else, maybe do farming or uh, mountain guiding or something. So we bought a house out in the archipelago in Sweden, out on the islands. And uh, we didn't have any electricity in the house. And it was a very Swedish house. If you would like ask a 12 year old boy to write, uh, to draw a Swedish house, that would would he would. <laughs> and uh, no electricity, but beautiful summer house. And uh, that summer I was, my wife was working at the American Express, the American company. So she was very busy. So I stayed home with our young son. I started cooking on, on the, the cast iron stove that we have had in the house. And I started cooking outdoors and I really fell in love and I was cooking for just myself and my family and the neighbors. And I just, you know, fell in love with cooking again and I really liked it. And then, um, you know, I, just, I don't know why, but I think there was, I, I don't know if gods were looking down on me or something, but, you know, one morning when I was driving down 
to get fuel for the car, a you know famous uh, entrepreneur, restaurant entrepreneur in the city called me and said that he had this site that he loved and he was uh, considering me as the chef. And uh, I asked him, what's the restaurant like? Well, it's an old uh, Italian pizza. And I'm like, does it have a wood oven? <laughs> yeah. And he said, yes, it does. And I'm like, oh, wait, I, I just didn't go. I, I just drove straight into the city and looked at it. And uh, yeah. Uh, it's just everything fell to place, and then a year later we opened the restaurant with it, which is completely dedicated to old Nordic cooking techniques. So. And as I mentioned, you you sat in the, the the sort of National Stockholm Library and delved into mm-hmm. books. What were the key things you discovered there? Because I I said, I mean, in your book you also write about the importance of wood, not just in cooking, but of course if you live in a traditional Swedish house without without wood, the the, the house goes damp right. and cold and becomes almost uh, inhospitable you can't live in it um what were the particular things you found in your research in that great library i mean first of all it, it's great with uh, the swedish uh, libraries because we are very spared from war uh, we haven't had war for 300 years so no no burning books so all the books are there so right. the royal library in the in in stockholm city is huge it's, it's just massive endless um rooms with old books so you know you need to to have help to get you know if you want to find exactly what you're looking for but i was what i was looking for it was complicated because of course if you wrote a cookbook 150 years ago you just assumed that that the people that you know were buying the book knew how to cook with a live fire because that's what they had it would be you know like us writing you know you know, walk over to the stove, turn it on. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it doesn't say that in the book. It just says cook the pasta. It doesn't say how to cook the pasta. Yes. And then so so it was very it was very interesting and very difficult to find. But eventually we found drawings of old cooking techniques and old cooking tools. And then uh, I asked Hepshult down in uh, southern Sweden and the cast iron manufacturer to see if they could find the, these old things in their archive and maybe remake them take them to life again so it took me like a couple of months and uh, and then we started uh, to get the right tools and the right fire and the right heat and well something you know the biggest difference back then was that you ate uh, food from the live fire every day lunch breakfast you know dinner so uh, you really were you were you were pretty tired of that you know flavor <laughs> yes so they were like enhancing it and trying to tone it down and cooking more things so it was actually difficult to find the real you know roast and the real barbecue barbecue culture of texas is very much a result of immigrants coming from scandinavia and germany in the early 1800s and then try replicating their smoking techniques and their live fire techniques into the local um uh, domestic animals and then basically turn it into the texas barbecue so it, you know, even like American barbecue has its roots in Europe, of course. You, you talk about, uh, you know, this cast iron stove, you talk about your tools, you talk about the Sami culture and so on. And everything in the recipe in the book, I mean, it's seasonal, but also all derives from the heat from this from this oven. Um, there's and I and I understand a lot of that. There's one word that I'm confused about flombadou. What happens there? What is that about? What is flombadou? I get the idea of ember cooking, but what is flombadou? Okay, so it's it's an iron pipe that you used to have in the rotisserie to collect fat, and then putting the fat onto fire, and then make it, reheating the fat so it ha- uh, hits a higher temperature, and then drips down on whatever you're cooking. Ah, okay. One of the great collaborators that you've worked with is Gustav Otterberg. Um, yeah. Now he no longer works with you, but uh, tell me about the collaboration and and what he brought to Exted, uh, what, were the, what were the sort of the secrets and the magic that he brought to your to your kitchen? Well, I think it was just, you know, like a, you know, Lennon-McCartney moment, kind of we sat down on, in a bar and we started talking and we started discussing things and then suddenly you found the, the you know, that we had a very similar ideas, a similar uh, approach and that we thought this was really doable. So without him, I don't think I've ever had made it. And also he was very... Because in the early days of the restaurant, it was very, very difficult uh, 
getting the smoke out of the restaurant and you know just getting ordinary cooks to yes. do what we were trying to do um, and you were you were writing everything on napkins i think wrote everything on napkins and we drew uh, there's this um uh swedish word eld start me it would probably tra- uh, you know translate to uh fireplace but it's it also has a deeper um purpose than a fireplace because it's also something that you gather around like a yes. campfire but indoors so it was something that was holy for the swedish uh, kitchen because if that uh, eld stod would die the people would die in the house because if you lost heat and it's minus 20 outside you know and then so everything surrounded the stove and this eld stod and we discussed those things how we could use that relationship in a modern context and throw that into a modern plate and actually getting people to pay for it and not becoming a museum because yes. that was the biggest challenge. Now us Brits can claim some credit loosely for uh, your restaurant gaining a certain international reputation because Adrian Gill came gave yep. you an extraordinary review and um Tell us about his visit, because, of course, he died a couple of years ago, the late, great Adrian Gill of the Sunday Times. Tell us about his visit and how his review really dramatically changed the life of Eckstedt. Yeah, so basically we opened the restaurant and then three months in, I think we opened in August and this was in December or something, the the, the biggest newspaper in Sweden, Dagens Nyheter, they had a, a restaurant award. And we basically at that time, were really struggling and I was actually thinking of changing it in, in one way or making it more accessible, more understanding because people were really misunderstanding the restaurant because they thought they were going to come to like an American grill or fish barbecue or something. Basically, he came and, you know, he didn't even ask, he didn't even talk to me, he didn't even call me, he didn't do anything. He just wrote exactly what the restaurant was all yeah, about. And he got it. And, um, uh, it, and then also I, I was, uh, he also gave like an, extra award uh, at the at the restaurant award and i was given he gave it to me and then uh after that we had full house and then uh, the year after that in march we had the michelin star yes um yeah. final question um your book of course a lot of it's about reindeer and the sami uh people who who look after all the reindeer herd them and so on um a lot of your recipes use reindeer hearts there's a wonderful recipe i noticed where you have uh, reindeer blood, um, the smoked reindeer blood and the Swedish pancakes. There's been quite a trend for vegan and vegetarian uh, dishes in this country. Um, what do you say to those who disparage the sort of food that you're doing, the idea of celebrating the blood of an animal? Um, where, where are you in this? Do you, do you worry about criticism from vegans and vegetarians or do you just plow your, plow your furrow happily? I mean, I think there's a massive misunderstanding about um, sustainability and how to look at the domestic animals and wild animals and game. And usually people that have strong opinions about this have very, a very low knowledge about how exactly it works and, and wh- how important these animals are for certain types of cultures. I I mean, my, my parents were vegetable suppliers and they had a vegetable stand in Stockholm. So I'm raised with the importance of, of a great vegetable yes. and follow the seasons with, with the amazing vegetables is extraordinary and delicious. But uh, you must be very, very, uh, you know, careful and sober when you uh, approach uh, this difficult uh, subject because animals... And eating animals have been a big part of our culture and human beings for a very, very, very long time. And we have done it in, in, in a sustainable way once upon a time. Now, of course, things have changed and, and you know, the, the difficulties with farming so many animals for this amazing uh, population that the world has is, of course, difficult. But I think uh, you, you really need to be... Uh, aware and read the subjects in a, in a sober way and don't get your information from one source because it's a very complex and complicated uh, mm. subject. Nicholas, very well put. Yeah. We, we must end it there. Your book, yeah. Exted, 
the Nordic art of analog cooking. Mm. Bloomsbury have published it. It's a beautiful thing. And Can I ever just say say one more yes. thing? I mean, the Sami community and the indigenous people of Scandinavia is very warm to my heart, and the, the book is very much a, a lot of it is dedicated to them. And I think the low knowledge about the indigenous people and European culture uh, needs to be stronger. So. If you buy my book, I think you'll read more about it, but you could also watch, uh, look it up a little more on the internet or YouTube or wherever you find your sources. But right. it's, it's a, we have a lot of beautiful indigenous people of Sc uh, Scandinavia and Europe as well, not only in uh, Northern America. Okay, fantastically put. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for being on Biting Talk. It's a great pleasure to have you and uh, best of luck with all your endeavors. Uh, Sabrina, welcome to Biting Hi. Talk. How are you? I mean, one could talk to Nicholas for hours, don't you think? I mean, I could listen to Nicholas for hours. That's the thing. <laughs> An extraordinary man. And um, if there's, you know, anyone who can convince me, I think, to get on a plane and go to Stockholm and eat in his restaurant, I think it must be him. Now, we're going to talk about a very, very different uh, food culture now. Um, congratulations on your new book, Simply. I want to talk about that. Um, you sort of... You pump out cookbooks in the way that you used to do supper clubs. I mean, literally, it's unbelievable. This is your fifth, I think. Um, each of them as, as vibrant as and as beautiful as the last. This time you're trying to encourage people to... The idea of cooking, cooking this sort of food, Middle Eastern, Iranian, Persian food every single day. First of all... You say you cook food every single day. Do you really cook every day, even on holiday? Every single day, even on holiday, because now I've got to the point I travel so often that if it's not for work on a short trip, I always look at renting apartments because I just go absolutely bonkers if I don't have a kitchen, if I go to a beautiful you know, city or place that has you know, access to exotic or interesting ingredients, produce. I have to, I have to cook. I, I can't, I go absolutely mad. So I, I literally do cook every single day. I, I don't come from a family of cooks and so nobody cooks. It's, it can be um, incredibly rewarding and incredibly exhausting and sometimes frustrating. Um, so yeah, I do love cooking. I just love it. But sometimes I just need a one, one meal session break. Um, just to kind of like find my feet again. But yeah, I know I cook every day because I love it. It's very, it comes very naturally to me. And uh, and fellow cooks will, will share that uh, angst, you know, when you, when you're in a, you know, a city like Lyon or wherever, and you see the market and, and you're, you or you're in Barcelona and you can't, you know, you see all this produce and you can't cook it. So are you, is it Airbnb or do you have the way you find your apartments? Are you, do you always carry your knives with you or do you rely on uh, local, local uh, tools? I try not to carry my knives with me. Maybe it's because I'm Middle Eastern. <laughs> Sometimes can be, you spend a lot more time in airports being questioned. Um, no, I, I don't really, I, I don't really find that you, I need to carry knives. I think, I don't really think you need your knives unless you're cooking professionally somewhere. I can understand that, but I try and lay off the, uh, uh knives on travel. Um, but uh, for the last five years, I spent Christmas in Thailand. And for the last two, I think two or three of those years, we just rented an apartment because actually it'd be cheaper than hotels for the length of time that we spent there. But we get the full space, the kitchen and the food and markets of Bangkok are mind blowing. Like any chef from any corner of the world will tell you it's incredible. And it just, it, you know, it can become a bit painful when you travel somewhere for four to six weeks and you're away from home and you just don't always want to eat in a restaurant. You don't want three courses and you just want maybe a piece of bread or nothing. So that, that kind of freedom to do that is a big thing for me. But also it's, you know, I research my recipes usually in countries that you would never expect would wind up in a Middle Eastern book. So, uh, um, I find there's, there's new things for me to learn in countries outside of the Middle East and even Europe where, you know, Mediterranean cooking is a lot of influence in my own food. But sometimes you need something a little bit different to kind of stoke your, uh, imagination and I, I get that a lot Southeast Asia for me China those kind of countries that don't necessarily have too much to do with um, Iran per se but uh, it works for me and but do you always find yourself drawn back to the food of the Middle East wherever you are and do you always you know do you carry some spices with you you'd be so disappointed I could lie and facilitate the illusion of my Middle Easternness but the truth is Persians 
don't use spice apart from saffron. We don't like it. We don't put it in our food. We uh, have very, very food to the rest of the Middle East, um, very different food. And actually, if truth be told, if you ask Persians, do you class yourselves as Middle Eastern? They don't. They class themselves as Persians and, a, and an empire long before the Middle East, you know, became a thing. So our food is actually very subtle. It's herbs and, and lemon and aromatic rice and grilled tomatoes and meat. It's very simple. Um, it doesn't really have all the sort of heavy spicing that perhaps Middle Eastern food is known for, which actually makes it a wonderful place to start if you are not entirely sure of the Middle Eastern region, because it's a lot more sort of nuts and, and meat and a little bit of dried fruit and an abundance of herbs. But the only spice I carry with me is salt. <laughs> Because I can't live without molten salt okay. anywhere. So not really an exotic spice terribly, but uh, cannot live without that. And Yorkshire tea because I'm an idiot. But Yorkshire tea. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's not go into that too much. Um, I want to talk about the idea of, um, you know, cooking Middle Eastern food every single day. Um, what is in Sabrina's store cupboard if we want to live like you at home? What are the fundamental ingredients that we need so that when we then go out and we see a, a nice aubergine or some some courgettes or we see some chickpeas that we can then come back? Because people do often get worried. They think, and they think, look, I would love to be able to cook all that sort of food, but I need to, you know, invest in an entire larder. And then I'm going to buy things that end up being like that Michael McIntyre sketch of the lonely spices that, that move house with you and still don't even take get the plastic wrapping taken off them? The truth is there are only really a handful of things that I may have that the person who has never cooked my kind of food has. Um, so we have all the basic curry spices like turmeric, cumin, cinnamon. That's kind of old hat because of people like Madda Jaffrey in our British uh, store cupboards. Apart from that, things I like to have, I love rose harissa. I'm absolutely obsessed with that because um, it's so useful as a chilli paste. It's completely North African, not Persian or Middle Eastern. Um, preserved lemons uh, or dried limes, which is the Persian version of preserved lemons, which are actually dr little dried limes. I mean, pulbebe, Turkish chili flake, or also known as Aleppo pepper. Apart from that, you've already got everything. You, tahini, maybe, those kind of things. And, and of course, and some, some pomegranate molasses, of course, because I was yeah. particularly drawn by your recipe for pomegranate molasses and honey glazed meatballs, which is yeah. one of many recipes in this book that just looks so delicious to devour. There is a richness um, in terms of colour, not necessarily in terms of um, you know sweetness of everything, but I think that's one of the the, the things that seems to appeal about your food. Um, it does look beautiful, and it does look like a feast. You know. Um, I wonder if, can you cook for one with this sort of food? It doesn't... I can cook for one for five days. Um, no, of course, of course you can. But, you know, the reason everything is so abundant because it's actually in, in its core, it's actually very humble food. There's nothing expensive in there. There's no fillet of beef. There's no, you know, lobster or anything like that. It's really, really humble food. So when you do a, a pot, a, a stew, a horesh, which is the Persian name for stew, you do a big pot of it and it would last for a few days. And then maybe you put some in the freezer to have another time because it's like all the best food in the world. It's, you know, humble food as the recipes that have stood the test of time from pies to stews to soups to breads every culture has them um but you know with my food you can always scale down there are obviously some things you can't but it's more importantly it's really really simple and sort of super adaptable which isn't that's the non-middle eastern element about it because if you show persians maybe most of my recipes they'll be like that's not persian but if you show western people that they go oh my god that's persian that's so exotic so you know, I've kind of helped and also distorted a little bit what Persian food is via versus Middle Eastern food. Because where are you with the sort of cultural misappropriation argument? Because here you are stealing ideas from every single culture, uh, regurgitating them beautifully and probably ending up being confused, but very well fed and entertaining and feeding all of your friends and family very well. So I think the truth about misappropriation, it lies in the insult of calling something something that is already in existence when it doesn't actually resemble it remotely. And I don't do that. 
I might say, let's say one of my books, I Love Lancashire Hot Pot, which is a British lamb based stew dish with, you know, thin sliced potatoes on it. I absolutely love it. That's my favourite British thing. And in one of my books, I paid homage to it. And I said, now it's not a Lancashire hot pot, but my love for this particular dish, you know, it's it's amazing. And here's a a different version if you wanted to try something with a little bit of spice. So I've taken inspiration from that. So I'm not knocking the traditional dish, like the one dish that it frustrates me more than anything in the world takes a battering name wise, shakshuka. You know, shakshuku is simple, tomatoes, eggs, a little bit of chili, you know, very, very simple. And the things that people knock up and call shakshuku, it's like, why do you need to name it? Why don't you just call it baked eggs and then steer clear of cultural misappropriation? Yeah, so the, so the secret there is 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 honesty and, and, and being straightforward. Final question, Sabrina. Um, I read during lockdown, your dream coming out of lockdown was to... Um, have a big old slap up lunch at the Ritz. Has this happened yet? Yes, it has. And it was oh, you've done unbelievable. It. You've done it. it was outstanding and very, very worth it. Grouse? No, he says, he says ordinarily, actually, because I said to him, I said, I know it's, I know it's the, the season for grouse. Don't grouse me. And he was like, no, no, I tend not to choose grouse for ladies. That's, that's, that, that's their unlittle written rule at the Ritz. And I was like, good, thanks. No, but everything else. And it was, spectacular it's rather epic actually i'm very pleased to hear it simply by sabrina gow easy everyday dishes from the best selling best selling author of persiana is out now it's 26 quid from octopus books sabrina it's been an absolute joy to see you thank you very much for chatting to us here on biting talk thanks for having me Uh, here's Paul Trudgeon, Fish for Thought Cornwall. Thank you so much, William. It's great to be involved. So much to chat about. Now, listen, you're the fishmonger in Cornwall who became famous during lockdown because of your lobster zoomidor. Lobster zoomidor came about. It was one of our customers, a gentleman called Nicholas Ward. We do um, a whole range of sustainable uh, British seafood and fish for thought. And one of the things that is very popular is Cornish lobster. We produce a thermidor sauce and he... He purchased a lobster thermidor kit for himself and his wife and both of his daughters and their families. And um, through the voice of Zoomidor, through the, the connectivity of Zoom, of Zoom uh, brought it all together. Now, the, one of the great things about your site, uh, as someone who's quite greedy for fish and shellfish, is that it makes you feel like you're a restaurant when you can order from it. And it's quite unusual to get that extraordinary array of choice and then it gets sort of delivered uh, to your door. Um, yeah. And this obviously wasn't the initial intention, I suppose. Well, you know, one of the things, so, so uh, we started Fish for Thought almost 15 years ago now, and um, one of the really exciting things when, when I became involved in the seafood industry is, is it is a very traditional industry. Um, there's an awful lot of um, businesses uh, that talk about things like sustainability. They talk about supporting British seafood. But actually, when you look in most, most places that offer seafood, whether it's supermarkets or other supplies of seafood, the range is quite limited. And and traditionally, that, that's often in the supermarket. It's because there's an awful lot of wastage. By the time it gets to the shelf, it's it's really quite old. And um, so there's wastage involved. And it's a high-value product. So um, we realized that online worked brilliantly. And, and that the range that we offer to you know some of the finest chefs in, in, on the planet here in Britain could work really, really well online. And, and that's certainly the case. The speed with which we can get the product from market or from direct from boats to our customers means that actually um, a, a direct to consumer online model works brilliantly, and that's why we're able to offer uh, the range that we are. Yes. Now, you have a wonderful eye catching um, idea, which is to do with lobster that we've been talking about. Buy one, set one free. Um, tell us how that works. So we've been working with. Um, there's a wonderful charity down here in Cornwall. It's called the Lobster Hatchery, based in Padstow. And what they do is they um, they basically take buried lobsters that the fishermen have landed, and they'll extract the extract all of the eggs, thousands of eggs, and they have a system where they can let let the eggs get to a certain stage in terms of maturity that dramatically increases the chances of their survival. Um, when they're when they're when they're initially hatched, they're they're planktonic. 
uh, lobsters. So they float around in the ocean and there's a huge mortality rate early on. So this charity um, enables them to be released back into the ocean all around the Cornish coast. And, and helps sustain sustain our fishery down here, which is a really important fishery. It, and it does sound wonderful. Um, of course, I suppose there's one thing, when you speak to a fisherman such as yourself about sustainability, and it's all about the way that you catch this and so on, it sometimes occurs to me, it's a bit like someone who says, I'm going to open an eco hotel. Well, surely the most sustainable thing you can do is not to do it. So how do you justify the fact that, you know, even your very existence of actually catching fish, where really... If you want to be able to contribute to the sustainability argument, surely the answer would be not to catch any fish as well and maybe grow vegetables on the shore, or, you know, on land. I think look, we have this wonderful industry here in the UK, and I think there are undoubtedly many, many methods of, of landing seafood that is completely sustainable. And I think the argument for not fishing at all just, just doesn't doesn't wash. We need, you know, we need proteins in our diet. We need to support some of these industries, and I think. Whilst there are some very bad practices and there is a lot of misinformation about sustainability, what we want to do is is, is be really clear with people about what we're offering. And, and I think, you know, our industry is, is very guilty of confusing consumers around sustainability. Mm. Everybody in our business talks about, talks about it at length, and yet the actions and words don't necessarily tally, and that's frustrating. So we really try and make it simple for our customers in terms of explaining what we do and indeed what we don't do so there's a number of products that we won't sell so we we uh, we don't offer any imported tiger prawns at all Um, several reasons around sustainability and other things that we don't do that but what we do try and champion is there's a uk farm based in lincolnshire that does uk tiger prawns in a completely closed loop sustainable way so we're about championing that to be honest william and i think um there's many great examples that we, we point to when, we, when we're doing that. Okay. Now, like a lot of um, hungry food and seafood uh, consumers, um, I've been ordering quite a lot of things over the last few months. Um, some of the packaging I find uh, uh, sort of quite disturbing, those horrible little sort of you know plastic slugs that one seems to get. Um, whole blankets seem to appear now. The, these other massive great pieces of plastic uh, in which there are, frozen god knows what that are keeping things chilled um you claim to have fully recyclable packaging now this is revolutionary tell me about it if it's is it act is it really true fully recyclable so what our packaging is we we've our industry this is one of the examples really within our industry of um uh, of doing one thing and and and, and or saying one thing and doing something else around packaging it's a real problem and the biggest issue with seafood is actually most of it shipped around in polystyrene boxes. So mm. even if you take the most sustainable food, you can be putting it in the least sustainable packaging. We replaced these polystyrene boxes some years ago now um, with a with a wool insulator, uh, which uses sheep, sheep's wool. Uh, it's a natural insulator. And then we have uh, gel packs within that to keep it cold during transit. And it actually, you know, for a long, it took us a long time to develop that with our customers because uh, one of the benefits of polystyrene boxes is they do keep things very cold for a long time it works brilliantly it keeps things just as cold as the polystyrene box and yet you have none of the wastage issues and that's fully um compostable um although customers use it in lots of different creative ways we do have some within our within our packaging there are some we do use some backpack products with plastics now they can be recycled they are recyclable but at the moment to be perfectly honest it's quite tricky because some roadside counties will will pick this up and others won't. We're actually working on a next level uh, of packaging that's um, in the pipeline right now, but everything within our box is recyclable, um, but it can be difficult in certain places. And I think that's frustrating for us and for some customers. Uh, And I was just going to say, of course, that there is a a dearth of sheep's wool out there at the moment because the market has completely plummeted. So it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, And I think I was reading that um, uh, in apple orchards, they're using excess wool um, you know they can use it during the winter in order to be able to sort of um, you know shield the roots from from frost and so on. Um, Paul, it's been fantastic to chat to you. Um, anyone who wants to order their 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 lobster and a whole variety of of British seafood can go to Fish for Thought. That's indeed, and it's been great to take part. Really appreciate getting involved, William. Thank you. Uh, great to chat with you. Thanks, and thanks for all the wonderful things that you're doing. And um, up the seafood revolution. Now, uh, Farhad Heydari is ending the show. 
and he's going to mix a cognac French 75 and he's going to de shroud the mystery of it. Farhad Haydari, welcome to Biting Talk. It's very good to see you. Thanks, William. It's great to be back on Biting Talk with you. Today's cocktail is a riff on the classic French 75. French 75 is so named for the 75 millimeter field gun used in the Great War, World War I. It is a cocktail that is usually gin-based, but can be used with other spirits, which is exactly what we're going to do today. And our cocktail today is a Remy Martin French 75. And I think the clue is in the name. It's a cognac-based cocktail. We'll take 35 milliliters of Remy Martin 1738. It's a wonderful, wonderful expression of the house of Remy Cointreau. We're gonna add that to a ice-filled shaker, and then add to that 15 milliliters of fresh lemon juice, 10 milliliters of honey syrup. Again, it should be one-to-one honey to water as the equation. A tiny pinch of sea salt. And we're gonna shake and strain that into a chilled flute. Slowly top this with some fizz. Pouring very, very, very slowly. Whether it's champagne, cava, sec, or prosecco, it really doesn't matter. It's a matter of personal preference. And then what you're going to do is going to clean cut a thin orange twist and make sure you get some of that wonderful zest and the oils onto the glass. And that's the garnish. And that is your Remy Martin French 75, William. Hope you enjoy it. Back to you. Thank you, Farhad. Succinct, talented, slick as ever. Farhad, hey, Dari there. Um, I'm heading straight to my cocktail shaker now, but I would say to you, if that's too strong an idea for your evening tipple, let me suggest a delightful alternative. It's my wine choice of the week, a generous, dry and crisp Sauvignon Blanc from Guy Allion in the Loire Valley. I love this. It's £13.50 and you can get it at williamshousewines.com. Now, thank you to all my guests on this week's podcast. To Nicholas Ekstead, to Sabrina Gower, Paul Trudgeon and Farhad Haydari. Now, if you've enjoyed the show, please rate us and do subscribe. Biting Talk is a front ear production and I'll see you the next time we gather for Britain's liveliest food and drink podcast. Let me just end with a quote I just spotted from Frankie Boyle. Telling us your instinctive reaction to something isn't analysis. Your feelings aren't a critique in the same way a burp isn't a restaurant review. I'm William Sitwell. Goodbye. Goodbye.